we don't get too much. Um, and uh, after we've heard from you, Mark, we can maybe have a bit more of a general discussion and pose mm. some of our questions. That would be great. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay, well, um, thanks very much for, for inviting me uh, here along tonight. And yeah, sorry it's taken uh, so long for us to uh, agree a date to, to meet. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, as I said, you know, my name is Mark Ruskell. Um, I sit in the Scottish Parliament as a MSP from Scotland Fife representing the Greens, but I also sit on the um, Parliament's um, Constitution, External Affairs and Europe Committee. Uh, and also the Parliament's Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee uh, as well. So I've got kind of, you know, uh, roles within the Parliament that underline the importance of, uh, of those connections that we have with Europe and the importance of European law, which I come across a lot. Um, I suppose like, you know, a lot of people on the call tonight, uh, I've been going through, uh, I suppose you could describe it as a bit of a grieving process since that terrible vote um, which resulted in us leaving the European Union. But I would say right now, more so than at, than at any point since then, I feel much more optimistic that we will get to a point where we will rejoin the European Union. And I think, you know, the reasons for that is that the need for Europe has, has never gone away. The idea of Europe uh, has never gone away. And the logic of us being in the European Union has never gone away. In fact, it's greater now than it has ever been since that European referendum. So I, I feel definitely that this is a case, not, not of if we will rejoin the European Union, but a case of, of when. And if we look at the, you know, what's happening uh, in Europe at the moment, the cost crisis, the climate crisis, the emergency, the dreadful humanitarian emergency in Ukraine, these are all interlinked issues at many levels that can only be solved by that strong international action at a European level being taken by, okay, sovereign states, but sovereign states working together and in solidarity with each other. So I, I think the need for a European Union is, is as great, if not greater now than it was back in 1950, when of course the drive in uh, rebuilding Europe after the Second World War was to, to repurpose the, the Ruhr Valley um, and its coal and steel industries for, for a mission of peace and prosperity uh, rather than war. You know, that led to the Schuman Declaration. It led to the first steps towards forming a European Union. Uh, and of course, has resulted in the, the greatest peace project that has ever been known to, to humanity. So, you know, the need for the European Union is there uh, and it will continue to grow. And I think it is a matter of you know, when we'll be rejoining rather than rather than if. Um, but yeah, on, on this grieving process, um, you know, I still have quite a lot of anger. Uh, and, you know, it, I would say it's not getting any better by, you know, knowing how Brexit has turned out and knowing that the disaster that it has been. And I'm, I'm kind of sick to death of, you know, thinking, you know, I, I told you so, I told you so. And I'm, I'm sure many people on, on the call feel that way as, as well. Um, I can remember um, the UK government coming to the Scottish Parliament with its uh, Brexit impact assessment, uh, which I think was done, commissioned by the UK Treasury. And at the time, uh, they hadn't published this. It was, it was obviously after the vote, um, but before the trade and cooperation agreement uh, was, was struck. Um, and MSPs like myself were invited to read this impact assessment and we couldn't get copies of it, we couldn't take pictures of it, um, we were invited to read it in a special reading room at Holyrood and we had to leave our phones in a tray uh, at the entrance as we, as we went in and there were UK government officials there checking what we were doing and uh, it was quite incredible. Actually, I did take in a pad of tracing paper, so I did manage to copy some of the graphs and the information that was there. Um, and looking back at that, uh, really everything that, that, that was said by the UK government itself that was going to happen under certain, you know, arrangements um, has actually turned out to be the case. So, you know, th this impact assessment looked at, at, at the most beneficial uh, outcome to Brexit, which would have been the UK staying within uh, the single market. 
and and it showed that that would be the most advantageous to to people and communities across the UK, but also uh, to the economy and and to business. But of course, that 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 choice wasn't um, made. Um, we, we headed towards something that looked a bit more like a Canada style or even a WTO style trade agreement. And, and this assessment did point out what the dangers and the impact of that would be. It showed that there would be a devastating impact on those businesses that rely on import and export, particularly components to make things that are then sold on uh, to Europe. And that, that has come to pass. It showed that certain regions uh, and nations within the UK would, would be disadvantaged more than others by Brexit. And of course, that has happened as well. And it showed that some sectors that were exporting to Europe, to strong markets in Europe, such as the shellfish um, sector from Scotland would be massively impact on, impacted unless trade barriers uh, could be fully removed. And of course, that, that has come to pass as well. And if you add into this the restrictions of freedom of movement, which have, have affected all, all planners of, of sectors, but particular, you know, here in Fife, the, the, the horticultural sector, um, you know, it, it has resulted in an absolutely disastrous Brexit, but one which we knew uh, was coming and, and we and we predicted uh, and I suppose with, with freedom for movement uh, freedom of movement um, you know the farmers I'm talking to in, in Fife and Perth you know they they Perthshire they built up uh, long-standing relationships uh, with communities for example in Poland where workers would come over and now you know those you know the, the caution the, the, the kind of reluctance of people to come to the UK uh, is really, really affecting their businesses. They've been trying to, uh, in recent years, source workers from, from Ukraine. Now, for obvious reasons, that's very difficult. Um, many of the male workers have gone back to Ukraine to defend their homeland. So they're now trying to source workers from places as far as field as Uzbekistan uh, and, and beyond. And that's proving you know, massively difficult. So you know, everything that was built up uh, within Europe prior to Brexit in terms of trade and relationships between sectors and different communities is, is now uh, under, under threat. And I suppose freedom for movement, I mean, you know, for what have we got as a result of that? What's been the benefit? I mean, you know, this is my passport. I don't know if you can see that, but some of my travel from this year. And this is absolutely absurd, you know, uh, passport stamping uh, madness. You know, I, I've collected stamps at Calais, uh, on the ferry, I've collected stamps at St Pancras, uh, trying to get the Eurostar across. And every time I've, I've attempted to go to Europe um, in the last few months, uh, you know, I've been met with just hours and hours of delay. And, and for what? You know, I've seen French uh, immigration officials uh, at Calais just having to thumb through my whole family's passports and, and, and try and look for something which they don't know what they're looking for. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they just stamp it. And the stamps are rubbish, by the way. I mean, they're not even collectible. You know, <laughs> there's no there's no joy in this. There's no purpose in this. There's no benefit to this. This is just ideological madness. It really is. Um, however, I mean, one of the uh, one of the, the the trips that I did manage to make, one of the stamps in there is a, a trip that I made with the External Affairs Committee to um, to Brussels and. It was, it was a really interesting visit because we, we talked with a whole range of people, um, you know, member states that are, that are within the European Union, those that are on the periphery, um, officials, MEPs, uh, many people within that sort of wider policy community uh, within Brussels. And I think, you know, overriding impression I got from talking to all of these people was actually just how valued uh, the UK has been <laughs> and how UK officials have actually built Europe and politicians uh, over the last 40 years. So, you know, it was remarkable to hear uh, people waxing lyrical about just how important the UK has been um, to uphold rule of law as an important principle within Europe and, and how post-war that's been absolutely critical to the European project. I think at the time that we were there, this was back in June, uh, there was utter incredulity that the UK, which is the upholder of rule of law in the European Union, was then prepared to rip up uh, an international trade agreement, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, and effectively by default the Northern Ireland Protocol. There was just disbelief that 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 this, you know, th 
this absolute foundation stone of the European Union was 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 being ripped up by, the, you know, the the originator by by the UK itself, um, and and uh, officials from from one member state um, said to me uh, that the UK has been so influential uh, in the European Union, but so bad at selling that influence back home, and I think, yeah, that that. That for me was um, was was quite a comment. I mean, it, and it, and it's maybe lessons there about you know how we took the EU for granted, unfortunately, in in the run up to the to that referendum. Um, but yeah, we have been influential, and and I think you know the UK, for example, designed the single market. Um, no surprise then when it came to Brexit impact assessment, it showed how disastrous it would be to leave the single market. Because we do understand that the UK does understand the single market and its importance and designed it. Um, and also in terms of environmental uh, laws as well, uh, the UK was hugely influential in designing a lot of the environmental regulations and practices, environmental assessment, for example, that's applied to all the major developments um, across the EU, the EU now uh, and still within the UK. It was designed again by, by the UK working within the, within the EU. Um, but, you know, we're out of the, the single market and, and even in recent weeks, uh, the UK government has proposed a, a series of measures um, to effectively dismantle a lot of that architecture of environmental regulation, including environmental assessment. And it's really not clear um, why they're doing that, because it's, it's not broken. So why fix it? It seems to just be driven purely by a very narrow ideological interest within a fairly small part of the Conservative Party, um, but it's driving the agenda at the moment and, it, and it's it's deeply, deeply worrying. But, you know, I think the gravitational pull uh, of the European Union um, is absolutely there and it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull us closer and closer. The, the route towards us uh, rejoining the EU, well, I'm a Green, I'm an independent supporting um, party, we're an independent supporting party, and we do believe that that is the best route towards uh, rejoining the EU. I, I, I recognise that there'll be people on this call who, who perhaps got different views on that, um, and may have thoughts on other ways that we can rejoin the EU. But for me, sitting here right now, it is a no brainer. I think Scotland is a as, a, as an independent sovereign state, but working with others within the context of the EU uh, makes a huge amount of sense. And that's what I'll, I'll be campaigning for when I get the opportunity uh, to do it. But for, for whatever routes we take to rejoin the EU, it is a matter of uh, not if, but when this happens, the logic for us to rejoin, uh, the benefits to our economy and to our society and our environment are huge. We cannot ignore it. That gravitational pull is there. And one way or another, uh, we will get back to rejoining the EU. And I very much uh, hope to be working with people on this call tonight to make that happen. So those are my initial thoughts. And I'm really happy to get into comments and questions and discussion for what remains of this meeting. Thank you very much, Mark. And welcome to those who, who joined us a bit later. Um, I think, first of all, I'm probably speaking for all of us when I say um, I think you're the first speaker that we've had who has really expressed in quite such a direct words as grief and anger, how we do all feel about what happened when we left the, the EU. And um, I, especially as someone who spent 20 years in Brussels working as an EU civil servant, I feel extremely full of grief and anger. <laughs> um, however, it was nice to hear that when you visited um, Brussels with other MSPs that people there do still remember that the, the UK um, officials and ministers and so on helped to take it to where it is. And you're so right that they sold it back here so incredibly badly. And I, th I think it wasn't just the politicians, it was it was also um, really the British press that messed it up um, to quite, well, well, Boris was out there after all as a member of the British press when I first arrived. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that uh, it was, I, I just felt actually super guilty when I did my first stall with people from Five for Europe once I came back, that 
the people in the streets still don't understand how Brussels works here because no one's ever explained it. And all of us UK officials should have been back here um, before the referendum, helping to helping people to explain that. Because once you stood for a while with somebody who was very anti you on the street and explained that it's not these unpaid civil servants who take the decisions, they kind of went, oh, actually, well, maybe then. <laughs> but it was a bit late by then. So my, my two questions for you is, when you were there, did you feel that people were making a distinction between Scotland and the rest of the UK? And then also as, as the environment was my main policy area for a long time. Um, it is really frightening while well, they're trying to take apart environmental assessments and basically maintaining environmental standards. And those that's that should all be devolved. So how is the parliament responding to that? What's the government doing about trying to maintain Scottish environmental standards so that if if and hopefully when we do start to rejoin, we don't have to redo lots of the aki but we've maintained them and we've managed to to keep the standards that we should be following if we if we were still a member yeah yeah Thanks. well i should say that you are still missed um in, <laughs> in europe so i'm gonna make you cry now um <laughs> yeah maybe cry even more <laughs> but there's a there's a strong sense that the the legacy of the british officials that worked there for many years um that, that your work is still there it's still part of the European Union, you know, and, and it's the spirit of that, which is, which continues to this day, you know, so there you go, we're going to start crying now. Um, <laughs> but, 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 uh, but, you know, and, and that, that's something remarkable to see that that, that lives on, um, but it's also, you know, it, it, it does shine a light as well, I think, to how we can come back and it, and it does show the value of our work and how we need to ensure that that is, that is retained within our own laws as well um so you know congratulations on the work you did and you know, <laughs> don't feel that that has completely gone because it's still there and it still acts as a pool for us to rejoin um I, I think in terms of um alignment i mean the scottish government has said that it wants to remain broadly aligned with european union policy now i i, I would say that that it, it is acting uh in that way um that's not to say that on some areas like fisheries um there is a concern that some have that we may start to drift a little bit away from european union policy but broadly speaking the commitment from alignment from the scottish government is definitely there uh, and it, it is it is acting within its devolved powers to ensure that that is the case the difficulty comes within the constitutional settlement within the uk where you then have a bill that gets introduced at westminster um, which effectively could override <laughs> aspects of uh european law in the, in the way that they've been um put into to scots law and i think that you know concerns that we have particularly at the moment around the the leveling up bill mm. um, and about how much that can extend towards effectively overriding um scottish, le uh, scottish legis legislation so th this is the concern at, at the moment and you know there's obviously complexity around some of these regulations you know will these changes only apply to england and wales uh could a secretary of state at uk government level effectively apply them across the uk um as a whole um and then the whole consent mechanism so at the moment you know if the uk government legislates it has to lodge what's called a legislative consent motion uh, sorry the scottish government has to has to lodge a legislative consent motion effectively at holyrood and has to say whether it agrees or not with the proposed legislation uh, at UK government level, but you know, the, the, at the end of the day, the UK government can just ignore um, the Scottish government, the Scottish Parliament, and legislate anyway. It is the supreme Parliament, you know, within the UK. So, um, if if it chooses to, it can override uh, Scottish legislation, uh, and it can choose to to you know bypass the Parliament and the view of the Scottish Parliament and bypass the view of Scottish ministers. Now, in the first, you know, 10 years of devolution, um, that happened very rarely. Actually, in the years after, that's happened very rarely. But in the last couple of years, we're starting to see, you know, m much more tension between the UK and Scottish governments. Uh, we're seeing consent motions uh, for UK legislation objected to um, by the Scottish government and Scottish Parliament backing up that view. But the UK government um, going on uh, regardless with its, its proposals for legislation. There's a lot to unpack in terms of how this might unravel, but obviously a lot of 
EU laws have come back to the UK. Some of them have been passed on uh, to Holyrood, but a lot of them are being retained. Uh, the control of those are being retained by the UK government. Uh, and the intersection between the devolved administrations and the UK government is, a, is an area of obviously continued tension. Uh, at the moment in a way that it wasn't within the first 10 years of evolution, but obviously very much is so now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we need to all keep, be keeping an eye on that. I think that the internal market bill is another one that's obviously going to allow them to, to reduce norms because people want, will need to compete with yeah. more norms in England, which is a nightmare. So that, that is another aspect to this, I think, as well, uh, mm. that, that is very relevant. And, um, you know, there are these things called common frameworks that have been set up which allow the governments um, across the UK to talk to each other and and to agree ideally certain policy areas um, but how these are going to work out over time it is it remains to be seen one of the early tests of that actually was with uh, our green minister Lorna Slater who wanted to introduce in Scotland um, a piece of law that would outlaw the sale of single-use plastics, you know, like coffee stirrers and stuff that's pretty useless, um, for good environmental reasons. Um, that's something that had to go through the common framework process. So it had to be discussed with UK government ministers because in theory, through the, uh, the Internal Market Act, if a producer of plastic coffee stirrers in England wanted to challenge the decision of a green minister in Scotland, they could do that um, because ultimately they would they would have the power to, to be able to sell to a unified market. So if they wanted to sell plastic coffee <coughs> in Scotland, uh, even though it was banned, uh, they could ch challenge under the internal market provisions why Scotland had effectively banned the sale of these. Now, as it turns out with that one, um, it looked like the, the UK government minister also wanted to ban single use plastics. So there was an agreement that Scotland could legislate um, under the Internal Market Act um, because England and Wales would be legislating, you know, almost at the same time or, or sometime after that. So there was a there was a derogation. It was a, they were they were a, we were allowed to we were allowed to legislate for this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, if somebody wants to sell something and they see higher environmental standards in one part of the UK, they can use the UK Internal Market Act to challenge that. Um, and obviously that could put a break on progressive environmental legislation, because what we've seen throughout devolution is parts of the UK, particularly Wales and Scotland, leading on uh, regulation, uh, you know, whether it's... Um, uh, you know, uh, single you know, minimum unit pricing for alcohol or other, you know, plastic bag tax, for example, and kind of setting the pace. And then other parts of the UK thinking, OK, well, that's a great idea. We're going to copy what Wales has done or we're going to copy what Scotland has done. The difficulty now is that if this Internal Market Act, um, you know, is, is applied in a very rigorous way, anybody that wants to keep the status quo because they're selling something that somebody else doesn't want can challenge this and that could stop legislation going through. So it remains to be seen how that aspect will work. Uh, but obviously that's a concern as well. Uh, it's something that our committee is, is keeping an eye on. Yeah, thanks. Um, do, would anyone else like to pose a question or bring up an issue? Anyone else? Oh, Paul. That was one of the things I was thinking about is you, you brought it up with the internal market bill, but we are actually beginning to fall behind the EU in terms of green legislation. And with the talk of repeal of a lot of the EU laws by the government down south, the RSPB, the National Trust, are really uh, getting quite concerned about what's going to be happening. Uh, after a long time coming I would say because they should have been more concerned about it before now but <laughs> also the the problems with sewage etc so it, it looks like the government is prepared to ditch a lot of the environmental protections and that will leave us much further behind the rest of the EU and to my mind will leave us at a massive disadvantage when it comes to trading with the EU as well in the future mm. what do you think I think there is that risk. I think there is that risk um, on a whole range of different areas. 
Um, I mean, that's not to say that, you know, Scotland is perfect. And um, I think, you know, we need, we need to obviously scrutinize the Scottish government's decisions as well. But I think there is this ideological drive within the UK government at the moment to, to not level up, but to actually level down um, regulations and, and protections. Um, and, that, and that's a great, great concern. I mean, it means that, you know, when we rejoin, there'll be more work to do to realign um, if, it, if it's from UK or Scotland or whatever, you know, constitutional settlement we end up at to, to, to rejoin. It, it will require a, a catching back up again. Um, but yeah, it is it is a concern. And, and I mean, who is actually calling for this deregulatory agenda? It's not entirely clear. So we had evidence last week at the, the um, Parliament's um, NZ committee covers environmental issues about the environmental assessment provisions, which effectively you've got to produce big, long reports whenever you come up with a major development like, I don't know, Fourth Row Bridge or Wind Farm or whatever. And, and we had representatives there from the development industry. So these are people who build big projects and they have to spend, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of pounds on environmental assessment reports. So you think, well, you know, these these guys make a good bet for backing this deregulatory agenda and saying, yes, it's going to save us a lot of money if we can shortcut these processes. But that's not what they said at all. They said, well, basically, we've invested in this system of assessment. We're used to doing it. We employ people to do it. Our boards, uh, our boards, boards of our member companies expect this to be done because it's good corporate social responsibility. It gives a certainty that we're going to have to do it anyway, so we invest in doing it, and we and we think it works. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it avoids big costs down the line. It, it avoids, you know, judicial reviews and other concerns. So better that we do it, and better that we understand environmental assessment than we that we do a weaker version of it or don't do it at all. So like, it's really hard to see who, apart from the most, you know, worst parts of the corporate sector, uh, it, you know, is actually calling for this deregulatory agenda. You know, business, business needs certainty. And if you level up regulatory standards and you're clear what those standards are and the banks and the investors know that what those regulatory standards are, industry can work to that. And industry does work to that across the whole of Europe and it invests in it. So, you know, where is this, where is this agenda coming from? Uh, uh, you know, apart from, you know, the, the dubious think tanks of, is it 55 Tufton Street or whatever that, that seem to be driving this policy agenda. It's not coming really from, from a, you know, it's not really coming from liberalized business and it's not coming from, uh, you know, a, anywhere else so I, it, 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 it's not clear where the, where the, where the logic is for it. But Mark surely if it's if it's a piece of EU legislation that's been passed since we had the Scottish Parliament because environment is devolved we've had to we've had to implement it through the Scottish Parliament as well as through Westminster no so can't we hang on to that Scottish legislation or is your worry that if we do then the, the, it'll be challenged under the internal market bill? I think the legislation that, that is already uh, in place um, isn't touched by the internal market bill. So it's new legislation that's coming yeah. forward uh, that could be that could be challenged if there isn't agreement through these common frameworks yeah. across the UK about how to proceed. Um, the issue about existing legislation, I think, is a concern if you've got bills coming in at Westminster, which effectively could override or usurp existing legislation at, at Holyrood. I think that's where, you know, there is a concern about how certain powers could be used by the Secretary of State. And then um, that also defeat that's also challenging devolution because if it's environment, it shouldn't it shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. Really? I hope. <laughs> Um, so sorry, I didn't I don't mean to monopolize the questions. Who who else has got something to raise? Anyone? Was that your hand up, Paul? Yeah, Paul Fisney. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry we can't hear you. Um, can you unmute yourself? Unmuted. No, I was apologizing for joining in late, but obviously I had I had problems. Uh, somehow getting in, but I managed to get there in the end. Uh, one point that I think I would find very interesting is your reaction to the, the new uh, sort of climate 
that seems to be emerging in, in the context of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, Liz Truss seems to be, uh, at least on the surface, uh, making some attempt to smooth uh, this whole issue. Uh, should I feel optimistic about it or not? Uh, <laughs> mm. it, 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 based on the performance of trust government over the last month, um, it, it, certainly it would be a leap of faith, I think, to feel optimistic about it. I, I mean, the, the facts are that you know, the Northern Ireland Protocol has largely worked for Northern Irish business. Um, and importantly, you know, it, it's upholding the Good Friday Agreement. So. Uh, to, to, to risk the economy of Northern Ireland and to risk, you know, the ongoing peace process in Northern Ireland uh, would be incredibly reckless. Um, so I, 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 I'm, uh, if, if, we're, if we're cautiously optimistic at this point, then, then great. I mean, certainly the, the mood in, in Brussels back in June when I was there, as I said earlier, was just incredulity. They just, just couldn't understand, I mean, A, why international treaty was being ripped up by the Brits but also why why would they be doing this and particularly talking to to Irish officials as well who who need you know UK Irish relations to be absolutely optimal in order to to continue with the confidence of the Irish people um, on both sides of the border so uh, it, it, it would be great news if if, if if trust does the right thing uh, and, and, and upholds the Northern Ireland Protocol and the TCA, but I have my doubts given the, what we've seen over the last month. And, and it's very, it feels like a very unpredictable government at the moment um, that, that can snatch at things from ideological perspective. And, and obviously that is, that is pretty chilling for, for business and investors in the UK and banks and, <laughs> Uh, people offering, you know, mortgage products and 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 the market generally. So, don't know, but but the, the view we've had in the committee from the business and the economy uh, of Northern Ireland is that, you know, the the, the protocol has uh, has has worked. And sorry, if I may continue, just uh, picking up a point that you made earlier about your own, as it were, preferred path to membership is, is via independence. How, how would you see that working out in practice uh, in terms of uh, applying for membership and uh, going through some a process of uh, uh, adjustment? How soon do you think that would be possible? And you know, mm. what, what is the reaction likely to be from for example, the government of Spain. Mm. I mean, it, 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 it's difficult to tell exactly what the reaction will be from every single member state. But, but I think what I, what I get whenever you know, I speak to European politicians and officials is, is tremendous warmth towards Scotland and also a, a recognition that Scotland is incredibly strategically placed within Europe, particularly in terms of natural resources, uh, and given the challenges that Europe is facing right now, particularly the energy crisis, uh, particularly the transition, um, you know, tackling climate change, transitioning high carbon industries to future, they recognise there's a strong strategic importance of Scotland being part of that mission, uh, whether that's production of green hydrogen, whether it's renewable electricity, uh, whether it's having expertise to transition oil and gas sectors. So, you know, there is a, although, as I said, oh, there's a gravitational pull of us towards Europe, there's also a gravitational pull the other way as well, uh, recognising that we have a lot of Europe's resources sat, you know, on our, on our doorstep. So, you know, the, the European Union is a pragmatic organisation. It doesn't seek to put up trade barriers. It seeks to respect the role of independent sovereign states, while at the same time building unity and solidarity. Uh, so I, I think that an independent Scotland could sit well within that, that kind of framework. Um, clearly, the fact that we have been part of a, uh, you know, component part of a, of, a, of a European state in the past, and we have, you know, and continue to try and maintain alignment uh, with the European Union, 
smooths that process. Are there tensions within Europe around, you know, Spain Catalonia question? I mean, of course there are, and of course there would be difficulties, but but the warmth and the gravitational pull of Scotland to the European Union, I think, is there, and I think it's strong, and I think Europe needs us as much as we need Europe, Poss possibly more, actually. Thank you. I think you're on future. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Something very relevant to Fife for me is, is um, Rosyth and a more direct route in and out. Because once, I mean, we still don't have the phytosanitary controls in place. And once all that happens, the, um, the whole Dover and Hull and all these places, queues is all going to start again. And it's something we've talked about in a few um, meetings, but I noticed that you're on the transport committee and I just wondered if anything's become more certain about the future of Versailles. Or I know there was an idea of turning it into a green port and making it a more direct route to Europe. Do, do you know if that's happening? Yeah, I mean, fourth ports, um, I've got an application in for a, a, a green port. Um, I would say as a, as, as, a, as a green with a capital G, um, I have some concerns about free ports and the creation of enterprise zones as well, what that might bring in terms of deregulation within those areas, um, but also what that could do to areas that are just outside the free port boundary, but also need investment. But, you know, notwithstanding that, uh, you know, fourth ports is bid is, is in there. Uh, if they're successful, it will result in significant investment. Uh, particularly in, in renewables uh, at Leith uh, and in Rosyth itself. However, I think regardless of whether Rosyth becomes a, a free port area or, or not, there is a growing business case to, to reinstate that, that link from Rosyth probably to, to Zebroga. And you've probably seen some you know, indications uh, in the press about who might be interested in that and, and how that might progress. So, so yeah, I, I don't think, I think there are particular reasons why that, that ferry originally uh, closed down um uh, and it was partly linked to the type of ferry it was and fuel costs and everything else but you know clearly it will be a commercial decision for any company to to reopen that but the, the pool is there the trade links are there um and and i and i think it would be a, a great service um and i think you know we should look at you know more uh, low carbon links to europe as well um i was speaking last week on the radio about cardio and sleeper um you know, the German Greens uh, working within the European Parliament um, have been pushing the Commission to back a project that will bring together and integrate uh, European sleeper services, train sleeper services across Europe, uh, running from actually Ukraine um, through to Portugal and onwards and upwards in, into Scotland as well. Um, and, and this is, you know, sleeper travel on the trains is 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 very popular in continental Europe. Um, you know, it, it would be great to see a service like Cardone and Sleeper, hopefully nationalised, integrating into that kind of uh, ticketed service across Europe that can utilise day trains and night trains and, and undercut aviation. So, you know, what I'd like to see is, is low low carbon ways for us to connect with the with the rest of Europe. The ferry, I think, is is one way that could support trade and freight, also potentially passengers as well, and bring more tourists here as well as tourists um, back to Europe. But I think you know there's potential to do more around rail integration as well with particular services, and we've got to really look at all of these options because we can't have a Scotland which is disconnected, uh, which is not integrated, but at the same time you know, expanding Edinburgh Airport, continuing to expand aviation is is not going to take us into space that we need to in terms of climate change. And um, and will certainly annoys a lot of people in um, North Queensbury and obviously Bay and other areas as well who are getting increased flights over their houses if anyone's on the call mm -hmm. from there. So, it, you know, expanding aviation, just from my perspective, would be a wrong way to go. But there's excitement and there's um, you know, vision within Europe about integrating Europe in transport terms and ferries and, and rail, I think, should be, you know, two mm. ways to do that. There's an amazing looking Swedish company who are just about to launch their first cargo 
tanker, but it's 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 with uh, modern day sails. It looks amazing. I, I shall send you the links if you haven't come across it. Because if if it was to be a green free port in Rosyth, then having cargo ships sailing out of the Firth of Forth would be incredible. Definitely something to push for. But we need to get the, the price of the Caledonian sleeper down. It does not compare favorably with sleepers on the continent. It's so no. expensive. It's a nightmare. I have so to, an, I don't an integrated think ticket would be great. Because if you yeah, that'd be Euro fantastic. Star, yeah, yeah. Particularly if you didn't have to wave your passport, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? If you yeah. just get on, wave your passport in Glasgow rather than having to go to St. Pancras or something else. But at the, at the very minimum, if we had a nationally controlled cargo and sleeper, you could push for interviews. You'd have sealed carriages where you can get on in Glasgow, go off down through England, and then get off in Brussels. <laughs> well, that was the original plan back in yeah. the 90s. The original plan was to have a customs point at Glasgow Central and mm -hmm. to have trains running, okay, not on high speed rail but integrated in terms of the trains then, you know, running on to Europe. Um, so I think that there's more, if we have an outward looking vision, that's about connecting, not just with the rest of the UK and this island, but, but into Europe, I think we can achieve great things. But, and, and hopefully out of that can come investable propositions that private sector can come in as well. Uh, if it's about ferry service and, and invest in those opportunities as well. Thanks. So oh, I realize time's running on, but does anyone have anything else? Beryl, you didn't have anything you wanted to ask on the environment front? No. Anyone else? If I could... Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't find my mute. <laughs> I, I thought you were looking for it, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> yes, I've got thousands of questions to ask about the environment, but it would I take... I thought you would have. <laughs> I've got, I'll no, go for your first 100. Yeah, well. there's, there's all sorts of things. You know, there's the, from the European Landscape Charters, the Birds and Habitats Directives. I mean, I'm, I'm really quite concerned about how the, it seems uh, from just general reading and listening that the new government in um, Westminster seems to be so keen to water down the legislation we have that's already been transposed into British law because you know as we've said it's um it's so damaging it's even damaging you know you, and you look at things like our farming sector you know before the trust government came in we had this proposal for elms um down south mm -hmm. and now it looks as though the new uh, government in Westminster um, could quite easily abandon that. And that was at least one bit of progress, you know, where farmers aren't paid just by their acreage and the size of their land holding, but they're paid for a variety of things, including delivering on biodiversity and climate change. Um, so this is, you know, this is really exercising the RSPBs and National Trusts and Woodland Trust of this world. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of things like that that we've worked so hard for and consulted on and had meetings about that now look as if potentially, hopefully it doesn't happen, but we've got to be aware that, you know, we might have more fights on our hands. Mm. But we're going to lose these hard won gains right across the environment. I mean, it's all sorts of things. There's marine protections and all sorts of things. Mm. I mean, those those risks are are, are there. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. there are devolved policies, and I think agriculture is is you know, and how agricultural subsidies are spent, where where I'm confident that you know a, a Scottish government will be able to continue to to design the the distribution of agricultural subsidies in a way that protects the environment, restores the environment. So there are devolved powers, and and I and I hope over planning as well mm. that you know we we can hold on to the to the control over the planning system in Scotland. Um, so when it comes to you know unconventional oil and gas fracking, uh, it, it will continue to be a, a decision that Scottish government, Scottish Parliament makes. I suppose the risk, the particular risk, is where you have areas that a intersect with this Internal Market Act and b perhaps intersect with projects as well. So if you have, uh, you know, the, the seas, for example, you know, there's an area which is within devolved competence, but also areas that are also within reserve competence as well. 
And those areas are, are where the UK government is particularly flexing its muscles at the moment. And, it, and it's also looking, I think, for ways to, um, you know, usurp Scottish legislation and challenge Scottish legislation as well. So, I, 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 you know, I, I think it would be it would be complacent to say, well, it's OK, it's devolved. Therefore, we can control it. Yeah. What I'm getting now is, is uncertainty around <clears throat> how these powers will develop going forward. Uh, and, and, and in particular, around the edges of these powers. And I'm starting to see the UK government encroaching in those areas. And there may be there may well be powers that that get challenged going forward as well. So where we want to take environmental legislation, stay aligned with Europe. Now we're in a settlement where there's the Internal Market Act, there's this uh, you know, legislation coming up, leveling up bill, and other legislation coming up from from UK government, which is constraining the devolution settlement, trying to put things through common frameworks for decision making, where you know the power in the common frameworks is largely within the UK government to decide because they've got the biggest market. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a there's a there's a concern there, and and whether that changes, maybe. I mean, the, you know, how many years are we away from a from a general election? It looks like, you know, <laughs> it look it looks like there's going to be change there, right? And mm. and certainly, you know, the noises that are coming from Keir Starmer and, and Labour are much more okay. If they're not rejoined, they're certainly you know more in favour of of pro progression and alignment, broad alignment. You know, progressive mm -hmm. policies. Can we say that? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so uh, you know, like how much damage can be done between now and then is a question. Um, yeah, but, I, think, but... I think we're all worried about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I still find it amazing that they can be more clear um, yeah. that, that they would rejoin. Yeah, it's because they can't actually see you. Especially now that 55 percent of the people. Um, seem to be pro pro joining. Yes, yes. Sorry, was was Tom wanting to ask a question? Yes, yeah, Tom. Yes, you yes, can't yes. see him. Oh. He's here. I, I, I'm here. I've been listening. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. Sorry. Um, while the microphone's on, I was just going to say I, what really annoys me is these people who say that we get all this European legislation put upon us by Brussels bureaucrats, and this is absolute nonsense because I'm an environmental scientist. And I actually got in latter years um, to go to quite a few of the meetings in Europe about the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, which was a massive directive which picked up a whole load of previous watery environmental objectives, dangerous substances directive, bathing water directive, nitrates directive, put them all into this big umbrella, the um, Water Framework Directive. And if you had any country had something good, useful to say, the commissioners were very good at picking up on that mm -hmm. and getting it, making sure that it wasn't lost. Um, it didn't win all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I do recall there was one, it was quite a technical issue on how classification schemes should work. Mm -hmm. And I, there was something which our biologists do but clearly biologists in other countries didn't do. And I was gonna vote for what we do, whatever happened. And it was obvious going around the table that um, UK was going to lose. But, and the, the English, uh, each country had one or two delegates, but you only got one vote. And at this meeting, there was an English um, chap with me as well but he decided since it was a scientific issue that I should get the vote since I was more of a practicing scientist. And it came round and I, I voted to do what we do, what Scotland did, and in fact, what England does as well, but we got defeated. It didn't matter. It's buried in the heap of methodology and we still do what we always used to do. We didn't do what other countries voted for. And mm. it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, the proof of the pudding was in making sure that what each country regarded as good ecological quality was equivalent, despite having very different ecosystems, because Norwegian aquatic ecosystems are very, very different 
from those in France, Germany, very different from those in Spain, Greece, but we each had to have a common view of what would represent good ecological quality and mm. hence an, what might be termed an acceptable amount of contamination. And mm. I say contamination advisedly. If you get too much contamination, then you've got pollution. You have to live with contamination. We're all contaminated, but mm. with all sorts of things. But we live quite, most of us, quite healthily most of the time, provided you're okay, you're not too much contamination. Mm. Um, and you know, the essence of this is, yeah, if you've got something sensible to say, you will be listened to. And it, I am very concerned that a lot of this good environmental, soundly based environmental legislation is going to be lost through mm. actions of the current UK government. Mm. Um, I mean, environment agencies, especially in England, their budgets have been so squeezed, they are not able to do anything like the amount of environmental sampling that they used to do. Um, Scotland has cut back an awful lot. It helps their carbon footprint, but that it doesn't help our knowledge of mm. the environment. And this, this is a great shame. But um, I, I mean, I think, I think that's a really important point, Tom. And mm. I suppose what I, what, 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 I, what I kind of learn about Europe is that that, that policy um, making process and, and how agreements are formed about how regulations are implemented is, is a very lengthy and a very careful and a very evidence-based process. Um, and and, that, and that, that, you know, that, that's hugely important because you've obviously got to bring everybody with you. And, and if you can't bring everybody with you, on, on principle, then things don't move forward. If you can bring everybody forward, you, forward on the principle, then at least in terms of the implementation, as you found with your, with your own discussions, there can be derogations and there can be flexibility around how things are, are actually delivered. And that, that's a very careful, considered, evidence-driven process. Um, and it's good policy making because you've got to bring everybody with us. My concern is that you know, we're now in a position where within the UK, we've got common frameworks, which feel to be very politically driven. Mm. And, 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 and where is that evidence base now? You know, where is even the data? So when we come to like chemicals regulation, the UK has now put in a replacement, a, a kind of yeah. parallel scheme to the UK, to the EU reach chemicals regulation yeah. process. Mm. But mm. the data and the equivalence of data isn't really there. Mm. Um, so, you know that that's caused a lot of uncertainty with business and there's you know the, the various concerns that come out of that so you know this careful evidence-based approach feels responsible whoever the whoever's in control of governments whichever color they are whether they're green or red or blue or whatever mm -hmm. uh, and, and and that's at the heart of 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 a, of a process the wor what i worry about the trust government is it seems to be anti-evidence uh, yes. and, anti yeah. and that for me feels deeply anti-european yeah yeah, yeah. And anti evidence and anti expertise, it seems to have been going on for the last five or six years. It's so bizarre. Longer, yeah. longer. And, and if we diverge, there is such a real risk of duplication of effort because exactly. if chemical countries who want uh, companies who want to export to Europe, they are going to have to demonstrate compliance with REACH and then they're going to have to demonstrate with whatever alternative system that the UK has in place. Mm. And that to me is unnecessary cost on business. Especially when you consider the cost of probably millions that was taken up by the negotiation of REACH. I mean, the, the energy and expertise and policymaking time that went into that agreement was so phenomenal. I had to sit in on a little bit of it, thankfully only a few articles, but... Even and the, the involvement within that of unions, of environmental NGOs, of, of mm -hmm. other voices, um, that very careful policy making process within Europe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what is the equivalent now within, within the UK reach? It's not, it's not really clear that health and safety executive are really talking to those same stakeholders. There's a bit of you know, discussion with devolved administrations around the implementation of it. But there's some, it feels that there's something that has been at the heart of European policy making mm -hmm. process. Which is now kind of getting junked, and it and it and it's the stakeholder, it's the careful stakeholder work, the the, mm -hmm. the learning, the listening, the the that's that's going, um, either because agencies don't have the time to do it, or because you know they're not the systems are not set up in a way that replicates that kind of work. 
so yeah there's something quite deep there that, that's being lost which which i can see from the outside and and you know concerns me I think it's also partly, and I would love if the Scottish government could take this up a bit more with Westminster too, especially if new Westminster legislation is is partly because of these um, the internal market bill and the levelling up going to be enforced in Scotland as well, is when you have such a big majority, what you were just explaining about the, the need with to take policy through a process that requires agreement from so many different sides, from the European Parliament, from the Council, um, and before it's even got there, through the Commission, it's a very broad um, consultation process. Um, so making policy like that is a very lengthy but careful and safeguarded process. And now with this huge, um, in, in Westminster, having a huge majority, um, a lot of legislation is not being reported on at all. Some of it isn't, isn't even getting done on the floor of the House. It's being done in committees. I mean, that's just a disaster for democracy. Yeah, that's right. That's true. That's the case. I don't know what the Scottish government can do about it because they don't have those meetings anymore that were supposed to be kind of central to the the devolved governments. That every so often there was a meeting, mm. um, if there was a piece of legislation going through the relevant ministers, we were meant to get together. Um, but it, none of that seems yeah. to. Happen. I mean, I think there is a role here for you know parliamentarians across the UK, across devolved administrations, and and at Westminster as well to be you know, sharing notes and, and ensuring that there is that, that scrutiny of executive power, of, of government mm -hmm. power. You know, uh, committees that I've been on have, have started to have, um, you know, meetings with counterparts um, in other parliaments, in the Senate and, and at Westminster and, and Ireland, although that's, you know, not currently meeting, unfortunately. But um, Oh, but, that's good. So you mean for committee members? Like yeah, if you're and, and in the House of Lords people. as well, you know. Who, who, All right, great. Slightly odd the way the House of Lords is formed, to be honest, and undemocratic. But nevertheless, you know, but the, Lord, the Lord Lords provide that scrutiny as well. So uh, actually, actually, drawing together expertise can 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 help in this fight, and to ask the right questions about why the UK government is is ignoring the evidence uh, and the science, and why why there isn't this due process. Because at the end of the day, you know, a, a better legislative process across the UK does create better legislation. And it does it does enable that this, uh, as Rodri Morgan, the first minister of Wales, once said, you know, a laboratory of devolution, where ideas can come forward in different parts of the UK and and and, and can flourish, and, and they either work or they don't work. But if they work, then they can be taken on. So mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's that's valuable within these islands, and it would just be nice to be able to continue that conversation, you know, over into Europe as well, and to take some of the legislative ideas. That are coming out of devolution within the UK, and and look at how they can can be implemented on a European wide basis. Because there's a lot of interest in what we're what we're doing in Scotland and and Wales within Europe. A huge amount of interest in how we're applying EU legislation, how we're how we're tackling issues like climate change, and a lot of shared conversations. Of course, there are, and there continue to be yeah. between industry and other stakeholders. But you know, obviously, that's easier to do if you're in Brussels as a sovereign you know but but member state of the eu fully around the table fully part of negotiations fully part of developing a vision of europe rather than just having a little office um you know in, in the european quarter and, and and having some you know burn suppers and some you know trade missions and and trying to be part of the conversations but never actually being at the center of them yeah very good point although it's a good office i have to say <laughs> but let it's me ask you let me... coffee <laughs> um, let me bring Larissa in for a last question then, just before we let you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, uh, and thank you, Mark, for this uh, very interesting conversation here. Um, sorry, I was I was late and I missed, unfortunately, most of your introduction. Um, but uh, looking at this, especially the environmental um, issue we've just been talking about, so to me, it looks as if it's. Um, the big problem is that there are three parts to it. One is the potential loss of environmental laws. Secondly, the introduction of the investment zones in England first, but who knows how that will, you know, um, happen in, 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 in Scotland as well. And of course, you know, we don't want uh, the environment in England to go downhill either. So I don't think we, need, we should be talk, talking just or thinking just about Scotland. You know, this should be 
nationwide, really, our concern. Um, and thirdly, it is, as um, Beryl already mentioned, the, the issue with uh, sustainable farming. And so if, if environmental laws and sustainable farming are going to be reduced, lost, um, and, in, and in, uh, investment zones are going to be introduced, that's a, a really bad combination, obviously, for the environment and ultimately for us. Um, do you think this trust has got any chance to get this through the House of Lords? Because my um, experience with the House of Lords is that there, there seems to be a lot more common sense um, amongst the, the members of the House of Lords uh, than in the House of Commons. I mean, no offense to any, any MPs, but um, it's just my personal um, experience with them. I've had, I've had contact with Lords and Ladies and their replies are much more considerate and um, the, the discussions I find in the House of Lords are very often much more, um, what's the word? Yeah, let me just, just say, I, I, I see more common sense mm -hmm. there than mm -hmm. in the House of, House of Commons. So what do you think her chances are? Well, I mean, if the government has a majority, it, it has a majority and it, it, will, it will, you know, all the Lords can really do is to, is to slow things down. Um, I, I mean, I guess what I'm hoping is that, you know, within the, the, the Lords that are, that are aligned to the Conservative Party, that, that there'll be that recognition that the trust government is destroying the country on, for an ideological whim and, and, and pull back. Um, you know, there are, there, there, there are decent part people in every party who are public, public service minded, who, who, you know, value uh, the country and, and want to do good. And, and the, you know, the, the, that is not what this government is doing at, at the moment. It's not what this cabinet's doing. And I hope that there's enough of those kind of measured conservative voices um, at Westminster that, that they'll be able to uh, change things, but you know it, it. It's not looking great for for a couple of years, I think. And you know, short of yet another leadership change or hopefully a general election, I don't. I don't see where where this is going. I mean, I think you're seeing you know people like Zach Goldsmith, who you know I, I certainly don't agree with on on you know many issues. Um, you know, but you know a, a, a voice who's spoken up for the environment in the past. Um, you know, being sidelined. I see you know other other voices within the the Conservative Party being sidelined as well. So I, I'm not I'm not sure where the resistance is going to come from. Um, but you know, I, I think it's incumbent on on all parliamentarians who who value the environment, who value this country, to to take action on this because it it is it is a reckless. Uh, agenda and, and and it's about you know dismantling uh, the states. It's about dismantling protections um, on on a, on a right wing ideological whim. And I, and I don't think that that reflects the majority of what even conservative um, representatives you know at Westminster or anywhere else in the UK actually got into politics to do. I don't think very you know very few people get into politics to dismantle all the environmental regulations. You know. I don't know. I don't know many Tories, if any Tories actually, that, that got into politics to do that. <laughs> like they, we might disagree about the way to protect the environment and the way to, you know, manage the environment. Absolutely, we'll have differences. But generally speaking, you know, the the, the goal is, is not is not to reverse decades of history, uh, and and to reverse decades of progress. Uh, you know, pe people come to parliamentary receptions with NGOs, they understand the need for progress. In my mind, they're not necessarily coming up with the right tools to get there, but but the driving force is, pro is to see a better world. I, I don't get a sense of that with this trust government at all. I think it's about a deliberate and reckless attack on our environment, just as we saw from the Brexit as a deliberate and reckless attack on the greatest peace project that, that we've ever seen as continent. And um, And yeah, they need to be stopped. I, I totally agree with you, Joe. Can I just ask a follow-up question very quickly? Yeah. Um, when I've worked with the three million on um, EU citizen um, rights, we actually had a couple of um, uh, projects basically where we got uh, the public to write to certain lords and ladies. And that really, I mean, the feedback from the House of Lords was that made a difference. They mm. really liked 
um, you know, the, the personal stories they were being told by EU citizens. I do wonder if we should do something similar in this case. And I'm just not entirely sure who um, in, you know, in the House of Lords would be best to address. Um, I don't know if you can help there, if you have I mean, any I, ideas, I, certain committees, yeah, for example, I mean, that kind of thing. The, yeah, you could you could target that. Um, I mean, the Green Party of England Wales has a couple of um, uh, members of the House of Lords, Jenny Jones and, and Natalie Bennett. Um, Scottish Greens, we or we we never been offered a seat in the House of Lords, but we we wouldn't it's accept. About time, anyway. isn't it? Well, we wouldn't accept anyway because you know we we'd want to see you know right. serious democratic reform of you know directly elected laws. But you know that could be one route um, is to you know. Uh, contact the, the conveners and, and chairs of committees or members of particular committees that are taking the legislation. Um, but but I, I, I think putting pressure on the UK government would, would make sense, you know, writing to Secretary of State for Scotland, Arthur Jack, and going in at, at the political level. I think if the Lords are doing their jobs um, and they're in their own committee and they're scrutinising the evidence, you know, they'll be asking the right questions. But where the power lies, continues to lie with the UK government. So I think challenging the UK government is the best way forward on that. Mm. And which of the, of the green NGOs in Scotland is in the best position to sort of coordinate that? Because what's always helpful if we're trying to support a, um, some sort of uh, campaign like that is if there's some, if there's an expert organisation like the 3 million was for the EU citizens coordinating it, then they can they can send out factual bits of information that allow you to sort of populate a letter with, with hard facts, which is always what's useful for, for a member. I think, it, I think it depends on the issue, but right now, you know, the nature emergency and, and the dismantling of uh, EU regulations it is a complex area. I think we'll okay. talk about that tonight. But... You know, charities like RSPB and RSPB Scotland are uh, leading some of the work in that area. And I think the RSPB obviously they've got a big membership, yeah, and a big that membership. Mm -hmm. But if they can, if they can work with others, if they can, if, if you can help spread that word, mm -hmm. uh, if they have a mobilisation campaign targeted on a particular amendment or a particular, you know, vote in Parliament, you know, that that's the time really to be appealing yeah. to the consciences of. Uh, Conservative M MPs, as well as you know, Labour and SNP and Green and, and others, um, you know, to to vote the right way and and to get things through. But it will it will require those Conservative MPs to effectively rebel, I would imagine, to get some of these uh, amendments and changes through that could that could make that UK legislation, uh, you know, less damaging for the environment. But yeah, I think they will be mobilising and. Yeah. I think you've seen some of the comments on Twitter from RSPB, both yeah. in England but in Scotland as well. That, and I've been able to raise uh, some of those those comments to the First Minister, First Minister's questions at Holyrood. You've seen the strength of some of those arguments. But they're mm. not holding back the language here. They see us as a direct assault. So, you know, these these are organisations that have, you know, members from different political perspectives. Now, there'll be people there who are quite conservative with a small C. Uh, you know, who may be Tory voters as well. And I think I think mobilising that section is really important to get this message across. Yeah. OK, well, we'll see what we can do there then. Um, isn't that, thanks very much for coming along, Mark. And what we're hoping from now on, we're going to be back in person and have bigger meetings again, because lots of people just plug in and listen to it after the event at the moment, because they know they can. Mm. So hopefully in the future, we'll um, have our numbers back up to sort of 30 or 40 people at a meeting and, and we can have um, a few different politicians along together and have a bit of a debate about where we've got to. So I look forward to that. Thank you very much for, for coming along. Okay. Today. Tonight. Take care. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Keep, keep in Thank touch you. if there's any issues as well. I'm your yeah, one of your MSPs, so I'm just get in touch with me at the Parliament. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.